Thank you, Michelle, for that introduction that I believe I wrote for myself. It's way, way, way too long um, and ridiculous. And a good reminder of how overwhelmed I am all the time with all those various things. But, um, you know, Michael and, and Lisa and, and Ray as well, I think, spoke to so many of the things that um, I had on my mind about what I wanted to talk about tonight. So I'm going to sort of refocus a little bit on some of the transition-oriented initiatives that we're doing at the Emory Autism Center, and then a little bit in terms of some of the focused work that we're doing in, in college and, and maybe talking a little bit about our, our voc rehab evaluations. But, um, so just to, to rattle off some of the things that we're doing, um, certainly we do a lot of school-based consultations. So we contract with a number of school systems all around the state of Georgia, um, and we visit schools and do student observations, teacher trainings, and you name it. Um, and what we find in that work very, very often is that our high school students that are getting ready to transition into the real world or the adult world or college or however you look at that, um, a lot of their IEPs and a lot of the focus of their transition plan ends up being on the academic side. And as you heard from Michael and Lisa and, and Ray, that side of things is important. It's not unimportant. But it's not the things that are going to keep you in a job and keep you in college and keep you doing well in college. Those things are those soft skills, if you will, or those executive functioning skills, those emotion regulation skills. Um, and so often we are doing a lot of work in terms of helping school systems, certainly helping parents as, as well, reshape our goals a bit um, to be more in line with working on problem solving, working on being goal oriented. Um, emotion regulation and behavioral regulation. Um, I love that, that Michael hit on that self-awareness piece. That's a huge one. So many of our students on spectrum, really, if they know that they have the label of autism or Asperger's or ASD and so on, they just know it as a label, but they don't understand how it really affects them in a personal way. They don't necessarily understand their profile of strengths and interests um, the strategies that work for them, how to identify certain challenges that they might have and seek out certain supports and strategies and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so we do a lot of work to reshape that story, if you will, and add in a lot of, in the way of strategies and supports and how we sort of teach those skills that are going to prepare our young adults for independence, for jobs, for college, et cetera. Uh, we're also doing some uh, transition-oriented evaluations. I never really know quite what to call this, but with Georgia Vocational Rehabilitation Agency. Uh, they actually, I love this, telling the story, um, a voc rehab agency up in the, the northern part of Georgia um, approached us several years ago saying, you know, we want you to do some, eva some evaluations for us. And immediately we were like, all oh, right, diagnostic evaluations, we love doing that. And they were like, no, 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 no. We already know they're on the spectrum. We already know that they have autism. We have no idea what to do with them. We're like, ah, okay, okay, we can get behind this. And so what we created was our version of a person-centered planning evaluation of, of sorts, kind of a, a mishmash of some different interviews, some observation opportunities, filling out some assessments and forms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, what we've learned through these evaluations are a lot of our individuals, and this is for adolescents, young adults, we have mostly been seeing individuals between the age of, I'd say 15 and 22 or so. Um, and what we're learning and what we're seeing through these evaluations is that A, our students, many of them struggle with that, that self-awareness piece. What do I really know about myself? So a lot of times we're recommending a counseling format for really working through that. Um, beyond that, we're also seeing a lot of individuals that are struggling with some version of emotion regulation or mental health concerns and, and so on, anxiety, depression, self-esteem, things like that. Again, for us, that implicates that, that counseling format um, for addressing some of those issues. Um, my preference tends to be for a cognitive behavioral format, um, working on uh, helping an individual understand their thoughts, their emotions, the behaviors that result from those thoughts and emotions and so on, and then building in a lot of strategies to help with that social thinking piece, as Michael was talking about, um, and that behavioral component. So a lot of times that's about organizational skills, time management skills. Um, I was just working with a client the other day who's an educator. Um, she got diagnosed a little bit later on in, in her life, um, and what we ended up talking about was 
just how to set a schedule for the weekend. How do you build in those sort of endpoints, those pillars, if you will, the, your wake up time, your sleep time, your meal time? How do you fill in the gaps in a meaningful, constructive, productive way? Um, the other thing, and this the ties, ties into this, the other thing we're seeing with those voc rehab evals is a total lack of engagement. Um, when Lisa was talking about that falling off the cliff sort of aspect of things, so many of our adolescents and young adults wind up being less engaged. You're in the public school system, you're being educated, you've got your schedule and so on, and then you age out and you're in college or you're learning different skills, whatever it might be, that engagement piece really goes away. Um, and when you're not engaged, you're more likely to be anxious, you're more likely to do things that are sort of non-productive or exclusively leisure oriented, and you can fall into a bit of a cycle there. And so engagement is such a key recommendation for all of our families and all of our individuals on the spectrum. Really work hard to find a schedule that keeps you engaged. Find the things that you're passionate about. Find the things that you enjoy. As Ray was talking about, find internships, find volunteer experiences, do chores at home. Any of the above really will help keep that engagement piece. I heard a very um, important story um, and I think it's one that's not particularly surprising for all of us in, in the room that are thinking about these issues, but um, a lot of the data now is showing when they look at things like quality of life um, for adults over the, the lifespan, um, it's not things like how intelligent you are and your cognitive ability that's predictive of quality of life. It's not your financial resources and your educational level, your family income, and so on. It's independent living skills. That tends to be, for folks on the spectrum, the number one predictor of quality of life. What does that mean? That means that if you're able to do things on a daily basis, on your own, more independently, if you can manage your time, if you can manage a budget, if you can take care of yourself in terms of showering, bathing, brushing your teeth, etc., if you can cook, clean, manage your home, drive, etc., those things end up being more predictive for folks that feel happy in their life, fulfilled, and so on. Those also happen to be a lot of the skills that will keep you in a job, okay? And so that's something that I wish we could all shift our focus a little bit. The academics are important, the knowledge is important, it's good to have a skill, but that stuff, that's the easy part, that's the, where we're, we're engaged, that's what we want to spend our time focusing. It's some of these other things that may not be quite as fun all the time, but really working hard to become independent in your adult living skills, your adaptive skills, um, that's something that I think is really critical that we, that we focus on. We're seeing that a lot as well um, in our rope rehab evals. Um, I'll wrap up a bit to say um, we're also doing quite a bit of work with our colleges in Georgia. Um, so we've gotten a number of different colleges, both in the sort of private realm and in the university system of Georgia realm, to get a little bit more engaged in understanding that they don't really know what they're doing with their students on the spectrum, and they're seeing more and more of them. And so we're doing things like training for faculty and staff. Um, we're helping colleges build peer mentoring programs. Um, I think that's key. Obviously, a lot of our, our panelists up here would agree. Um, it's really, really difficult to be a college student. And then it's even harder to be a college student and not really know what to do, how to navigate things, where to find friends, how to get advice, get that donkey rule going, get someone to check in with, right? And so we're working with a number of different universities to build those peer mentoring programs and we do that both in a systemic way as well as an individual and sort of case by case way as well. Um, so I will cut myself off there because I know we're all short on time and looking for the opportunity to ask questions and, and so on but um, please when we have that time if you've got questions about the different work that, that we're doing at the Emory Autism Center um, please ask and I think just to conclude from that think positive perspective Get engaged, find things to do that highlight your strengths and interests, and really build upon those skills. And I think that's really where we see that magic happen for our young adults and, and adolescents on, on the spectrum.